doors are closed, nor no escape anymore. Uh, let me tell you two secrets. It's the first time in my life I prepared a speech. And the second one is the world needs batteries. And our industry needs batteries. Um, batteries are make or break uh, on our road uh, to decarbonization of our business model of, uh, of mobility. And therefore, I'm extremely grateful uh, that you all are here today. And this is also the reason why I am here today. It's uh, a great honor, a great pleasure for us, for Audi, uh, to have you all here with us. Uh, the wonderful audience, uh, the panel, the partners from GBA, and so on. It's, uh, it's simply great. Batteries, batteries face uh, many, many uh, different requirements, uh, sometimes even conflicting requirements. Uh, they need to perform, they need to be safe, they need to be uh, available, affordable, uh, uh, they need to be uh, reliable and sustainable. And just think about uh, in many of those aspects, sustainability is uh, also woven deeply in the fabrics. So uh, sustainability is key for us. Uh, we have to make sustainability right from the beginning on with batteries because we just use it because of sustainability in our industry. And so, uh, we have to look how to do that, and uh, I think all of us here know that uh, when talking about sustainability, we talk about transparency from the beginning on. And uh, this transparency, uh, we need to build up in a extremely complex value chain. And uh, doing this, we need clear goals, clear rules, clear uh, processes, uh, systems behind, and this is what GBA is doing uh, for the whole uh, community of uh, battery manufacturers, of all those raw material folks uh, involved in the business, uh, and us downstream, who are the economic operator, bringing the, uh, the product to the market. Um, the battery passport will show the sustainability performance as of the moment, but also will identify future hotspots or white spots, and uh, will help to, uh, to do the abatements there. Abatements in an efficient, but also effective way. So therefore, we need this battery passport. It would also be a very important enabler for circular economy. Uh, circular economy, if you would ask me, I would say is the masterpiece of everything in sustainability. Uh, once we can uh, uh, create a real working circular economy, uh, we will automatically solve other problems of sustainability as well. And so therefore, um, uh, the, the, the passport uh, carrying all this lifetime information will help to, for example, raise the residual value of a used battery or can steer a used battery to the right second or third uh, usage application and even down the road uh, to full recycling. So, uh, battery passport is important in many, many ways. Um, the new upcoming European battery regulation has in Article 65.5 one nice sentence which says, all information and data included in the product passport shall be based on open standards developed with an interoperable format, and so on. Remember, open standard, interoperable. This is exactly what GBA is doing. Uh, this means uh, battery passport is built on this 
uh, on these requirements, and uh, we can see the first parts of this battery passport here today in this proof of concept. And I'm really, really happy that we made this pass. It wasn't an easy one. It was hard work, but finally we did it. We, what did we do? Well, um, we tested uh, the GBA rule box we have already developed, uh, which are uh, greenhouse gas and uh, human rights child labor. Those two slash three uh, rule books are already available for everybody here. Uh, so we took them and tested this. Uh, we tested uh, uh, the data links. We had to build up trust. Very, very important. Trust in the value chain. We learned that a battery is actually much more than just a bunch of battery cells. No, there are complex boundaries. Uh, there are uh, even uneven boundaries uh, for, this, uh, for these batteries. And let me say, we learned to speak and understand a new sustainability battery language. Because of this trust building, of this interaction in the value chain, uh, getting the things uh, sorted out right, uh, having the same definitions, uh, and so on, uh, this was all uh, the learning we had in this, uh, in this project. And all those vast assets and learnings will now go into the next phase of developing uh, the battery passport, because we are by far not ready yet. Uh, there are so many puzzle pieces uh, necessary to get the full picture of a fully functional uh, battery passport. And uh, so there is work ahead, uh, but my feeling is uh, we are somehow in the ramp up curve now. Uh, uh, people have been attracted, they, have to, uh, they had uh, their, their, their interfaces, uh, and so we have now uh, all the, the foundation, let's say, uh, for this uh, future upcoming work, and, uh, and also the regulators. They really push hard and help by doing so uh, that speed uh, gets on, into the overall uh, undertaking. So, I want to say a big, big thank you uh, to all our colleagues, uh, to the partners uh, we had from around the world. Uh, we had a fantastic collaboration set up in a perfect pre-competitive environment. So uh, this was another uh, aspect for being successful uh, in the end and uh, showing, being able to show what we have today. Coming to my end here, I have one promise and one wish for you. The promise is um, we will do our very best to make this battery passport as user-friendly as possible. Doing this, uh, we, t we reuse uh, whatever is already available available, be it standards, be it procedures, be it norms, uh, uh, be it definitions, whatever. Whatever is available, is uh, proven, is uh, useful. This we put into our battery passport uh, to avoid double work, uh, to create, to get uh, cross recognition, and so on. And uh, we team up with corresponding initiatives, uh, like for example, Catena X will be very, very um, uh, important in terms of uh, IT technology for us, Surpass. Uh, you might have heard about this uh, European project uh, running, or the uh, German Battery Pass Consortium. All those we work extremely tight together to get uh, things right uh, in a smooth way. And my wish is, that we all have our sights on one common goal, to make the battery passport a real shared global standard. Because having uh, many, many standards around, uh, many different uh, languages to speak, many different uh, 
um, legislations. That would be a horrible uh, thing for us, uh, for the whole industry, and therefore, this is my hope, and therefore, also, I just can say, GBA is important, and uh, Inga, I think that's the right time for this wonderful panel. Thank you so much, Josef. Um, and thanks, everybody, for joining us here. My name is Inga Peterson. I'm the executive director of the Global Battery Alliance. Uh, Josef has been working with the Global Battery Alliance for so long that he thinks that everybody knows who we are and what we do. I'm uh, going to help you a little bit here, <laughs> for those of you who don't. Um, so the Global Battery Alliance was, was founded in 2017 here at the World Economic Forum, really in the realization of how critical batteries are going to be for the green transition. Um, but that forecasting this growth and, and the need for scaling batteries is really going to have to happen in a sustainable manner um, if we want to achieve uh, these double objectives of doing it um, in respect also of human rights um, and really mitigating our impacts. Um, so we are now an independent organization. Uh, we've incorporated last year as a not-for-profit organization in Belgium and we've grown to over 130 members, many of whom are here today. Um, really spanning the entire battery value chain, from mining companies down to recyclers, non-governmental organizations, global labor unions. Um, we have a, a broad base of, of members that have realized that only collective action in a multi-stakeholder setting can make these battery value chains more sustainable. So today, we would like to introduce you to this tool that uh, we really consider a critical instrument to help us um, facilitate this transition. And I'm joined here today, and it's my great um, privilege to, to introduce you to our panel. So we have Benedikt Sobotka, CEO of the Eurasian Resources Group and a founding member of the GBA, um, a first hour advocate. <laughs> uh, same for um, Matthias Miedreich, CEO of Humocor, and also a founding member of the GBA. And Minister Fitzgibbons um, from Quebec, Minister of the Economy for Quebec, um, who are also staunch supporters of the battery passport concept. They're represented both on the board of directors of the GBA and also on the steering committee for the global battery passport. So today we'd like to look a little bit at the key challenges that we're facing currently um, in battery value chains and then look at how the battery passport may help us resolve some of that. Um, we have a bit of a truncated value chain here. Well, uh, we might refer back to the audience um, to help us with some of the gaps, but I'd like to start in the upstream. Uh, Benedict, just on Monday, we co-published a study with McKinsey um, where we revisited our original vision report and found that um, the growth forecast for batteries is even more staggering than previously anticipated, um, up to 30% annual growth between now and 2030. We also learned about the tremendous opportunities of making this growth more sustainable, that there could be potential emissions reductions of up to 90% um, within battery value chains and battery production. So all of this has cast a sudden spotlight um, on the upstream, on the mining sector. Do we have enough minerals to feed <laughs> this demand, to feed these forecasts? In your experience, what are some of the most common challenges that we're facing um, at the starting point of our value chain? Well, uh, thank you, Inga. This is uh, personally for me an exciting moment because I still remember how um, four or five like-minded individuals sat down at the end of 2016, I think that time we were thought uh, to be crazy, to come up with something that is now today the global battery lines. And we're around a coffee table, it tells us something about the magic of Davos. Four or five people around the table can create something that is now becoming an industry standard. Um, it's very exciting. Um, but when we sat down back then, the focus was very much on how do we build up a supply chain um, that is the supply chain of the 21st century, but it's not based on practices of the 17th or 16th or 15th century. I'm looking at Atle here, here from the International Labour Union. So it's, uh, we, the ambition there was to say, how can we build a, a supply chain that's sustainable and clean? What we did not know is that this supply chain would be one of the most staggering growth stories in the history of mankind. <laughs> I mean, in 2016, um, if you look at just electric, electric vehicles in 2016, in all of 2016, the same amount of cars, electric vehicles were sold than are sold today in one day. Just to give you an, give you an idea of the, the order of magnitude we're looking at. Now, the mining industry, and uh, we are, we're a, a big mining company with about 100,000 people. Uh, we, own, we operate the largest uh, single industrial scale cobalt operation. Um, 
for us to double production is something you would do typically over 10 years if you're good and if you're lucky. Now today we're supposed to add 20, 30, 40 percent of production every year. This has never been done before in history. Uh, and it's not a question of money, right? There's a lot of money in the industry. There's a lot of capital that's looking to be deployed. Um, the, the challenges are licensing. The challenges are community interaction. The, the challenges are uh, complicated jurisdictions. Because today, um, most of the large mining companies, they operate in, in, in jurisdictions like Canada, like Australia, um, some other very safe jurisdictions, South, uh, South America. But the future minerals that we have to built up as part of the supply chain, they're going to be in more complicated jurisdictions that may not have the same framework to operate safely and sustainably, that may have significant political and uh, expropriation and country risk. And as an industry, we have to deal with that. At the same time, we're getting pushed by customers, give us a sustainable production. So we don't lower our standards, whether we operate in Central Africa or in Central Asia or in Central America. We use the same global standards and the, the major mining companies, they, they pride themselves of using those global standards. But of course, if you push the supply chain very hard, you, you do get bad behavior. And we see that today. We see it in some of the products, um, whether it's in cobalt and lithium and in nickel. Um, you push a supply chain too hard, you get bad behavior. So one of the objectives that I've been, we've been so supportive of the, the GBA from the beginning is, is you need a level playing field. If we want to expand the supply chain, we have to have the same rules. And the best way to enforce rules is using a stick and a carrot. Uh, the carrot, we all know the business is growing. It's the biggest purchase order in history for our industry. But you need a bit of stick as well. And the best stick you can get is transparency, right? Because if you give consumers a choice, what are they actually going to buy? What's the greenhouse gas emission footprint? Have you violated human rights in your production process? If you can make that transparency, you give a lot of power to consumers because consumers have a choice. Six years ago when we started the GBA, consumers had no choice because they wouldn't know. They wouldn't know where the product came from. They wouldn't know where it was refined, how it was refined. Was it using hydroelectric electricity? Was it using coal-fired power? Uh, there was no transparency. So what I think we've achieved here with this pilot um, is, is quite exceptional because for the first time it will give end customers the ability to make a choice. And that's the best stick you can get to incentivize better behavior in what we think is going to be an incredibly incredible business opportunity for many of us here and we have to make sure we do that in a sustainable fashion. Thanks Benedict. Um, moving down our value chain, um, the issue of material scarcity is on everybody's mind, the sustainably Im sustainability impacts of that production as well. Usually commentators rush to recycling and circularity as the key solutions um, to address these challenges. So I'd like to ask you Matthias, what are the key challenges with that today and is that a feasible proposition? Yeah, I'm very uh, happy also as Benedict to, uh, to speak on that occasion. So as I already said, we are one step down the value chain. Yumiko is uh, taking the minerals that come from mining and we are transforming them into active materials, what is called the cathode active materials and others. Besides that, also we are uh, in the area of circular economy already since 30 years. So that's at the heart of our uh, thinking. And, uh, as usual, there are three things that uh, are currently um, limiting the ability to do a full-scale circular approach for those metals that are uh, not enough available or that have uh, not the right CO2 footprint. So the first one is technology. So if you look to um, uh, the recycling process of uh, lithium-ion batteries today, there is a certain yield that you can achieve, right? So you can recover uh, nickel, uh, cobalt, lithium, manganese, to a certain percentage of what you put in by injecting batteries in the process. Now, uh, we are not at the end of the road for that. There needs to be a lot of work and innovation put in place <clears throat> that the yield, sorry, that the yield is really high. So currently the biggest challenge is lithium because the recovery rates on, on nickel and cobalt are already well advanced in the high 90 percent. Uh, lithium, we are not there yet. So we are more in the 60, 70, 80 percent. So it would be uh, even an economical uh, disaster if you have to throw away 30% of the lithium that you have, not to speak of uh, the CO2 footprint. That's the first one. The second one is a, is a regulatory topic. Um, and it's not so much the permitting uh, like we have in the mining side. It's more the supply chain and the logistic legislation. Today, when you dismantle a battery from a car, it turns from an automotive component to hazardous waste by legislation. 
And with that, to transport it, to, uh, to process it, to bring it forward, is really uh, very, very difficult, if not impossible. And we are talking about quantities, even though the growth rates have been high, but they are not the quantities that we will see in the future. So the third topic, and I come back to that, and, and we heard that a couple of times uh, in the last two days, is the, the stick and the carrot approach. Because there is also a perception that recycled materials must be cheaper automatically, right? Because they're recycled. Uh, in fact, if you go through the complete value chain, that's not, uh, that's not the case. They are much more CO2 efficient, up to 90, 95% better in CO2, but sometimes more, uh, more expensive. So how do you bring that forward? So you can either say you put a stick because you are penalizing CO2 footprint, scope three footprint of products. So you, you would pay a penalty if you don't use those materials, so it's even cheaper to use them. Or you can use the carrot approach, which is currently the, the North American, the US approach with the IRA. You can um, uh, you know, give uh, subsidies and funding to the infrastructure, to the capex that is needed to do this uh, recycling. So what is, I, I even don't want to judge what is the better one. I think probably you need both of them. But if you bring those three elements together, technology, uh, it's legislation, uh, and the third one is uh, support, business model, uh, pricing at the end of the day, that will truly make it successful. But still, we also don't have to dream that tomorrow we can uh, have a large quantity of recycled materials because the pipeline first has to, to fill it up. And there are some uh, studies, especially on lithium, that say probably beyond 2040, we will reach a peak lithium so that you can use the lithium from recycling to fulfill all the, all the needs. So we have decades in front of us where we rely still on the supply chains coming from virgin streams. And we also have to focus to optimize those, uh, of course, in terms of, of CO2. Thank you. After hearing some of these industry perspectives, I'd now like to turn to you, Minister Fitzgibbon. Canada and Quebec in particular have made significant investments into uh, the development of domestic battery value chains. In your experience, what are some of the most significant challenges in bringing these value chains to scale fast enough to meet the Paris Agreement targets? Yeah, well, thank, thanks for the invitation. Honored to be here with my colleagues. Perhaps just a word on uh, why having a Quebec politician sitting here in a panel and the least knowledgeable on batteries, but um, our, just to put to the context of Quebec, Quebec, we're like a Nordic country, uh, 8.5 million people. Um, we're blessed with uh, renewable. 99.9% uh, .9 of our uh, energy is um, hydro. We're building now the, uh, the wind farm, so we've got that privilege. We also have the privilege of having a lot of the critical minerals that are important in the value chain of the battery. Four years ago, when we came into office, when I came into office, there was a blank piece of paper. You know, battery, EV, didn't exist in our vocabulary. So we quickly kind of came, came around, because as a small community, we need to focus on where we can shine internationally. Uh, and certainly, given what's going on in the supply chain, the tightening of supply chain in North America, we felt we had a role to play. So on our EV strategy, we focus on minerals to battery materials. I'll talk about that, of course, which is relevant. We also are able to produce commercial uh, EVs. We make, uh, for example, school buses, uh, EV school buses for California. Uh, and we make ambulances and other uh, devices. So we, Ontario making makes the car. We make the airplanes. And also we are focusing a lot on urban mining. I believe that urban mining will be a requirement if you want to be totally ESG compliant. And we have a lot of work going on right now with uh, new hydrometallurgy technology to recycle most of the uh, battery material. So given that, on the mineral side, clearly we felt that um, our green economy uh, plan uh, is comprised of various uh, segments. One of the segments is to uh, try to decarbonize the uh, supply chain of EV batteries to help North America and to also use our materials uh, more properly, use our electricity in the right way. So we really push, of course, the Paris Accord. We were committed to reduce our GHG by 37.5% from the 1990 level. But uh, I think the, the, the civil society is pushing us forward. And uh, we're really uh, accelerating the pace. The key challenge for uh, politicians is to have a business environment which is conducive for investment. So we need to look at the zoning, for example, how we convert our green zoning, a lot of agricultural 
uh, land in Quebec they want to maintain. But when you dezone uh, a land to make uh, something which will help the, uh, the value chain uh, on the EV side makes sense. So we are accelerating that the rezoning that sometimes we need to do. Uh, the permitting, we need to also be, um, be strong on that because it takes a long time. And uh, given the pace at which the industry is going, we need to show that uh, we respect, on the one end, the ESG rules. We want to be uh, uh, really responsive. But at the same time, we need to allow companies to come and, uh, and build uh, concerns here in Quebec. And the uh, last thing also, we need to support uh, the whole business environment and make sure that the uh, people are, 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 are convinced that we are kind of shovel ready. We have industrial park, for example, in Quebec, we have a park called uh, Bicancourt Park where there's three municipalities. And four years ago, there was nothing there. Now we're talking about billions of dollars which will be invested in the next uh, four or five years. So I think our role as a government is to get the business platform conducive for investment Yet, we need to be responsive because civil society is requiring us to be, to be responsive in terms of the ESG rules. And that's why the GBA allowed us to mix the two. We've got the ingredients. Let's make sure we got the traceability. We'll talk about that. And that, that's the role of the government. Maybe I can chip in for a second because it's always good to talk about how good you are yourself, right? But if external sources say that, uh, it's maybe even more proof and I can fully confirm that uh, Quebec is a really benchmark for us, for the industry, in terms of uh, being uh, pro-minded for electrification and trying to reduce any hurdles possible to be fast, to be efficient, and uh, to have the full uh, value chain in scope. So I, I really congratulate you to what you have set up in that environment. Thank you. Um, one word that already keeps popping up in these conversations and as part of the solution is the term of transparency because we really cannot manage or improve what we can't measure. So for this reason and to be able to somehow quantify and assess sustainability impacts, uh, the GBA has over the past two years started developing an indicator framework um, against which these efforts can be assessed. Uh, we've developed a greenhouse gas rule book which was published in October which really sets out a comprehensive set of rules on how to calculate the battery carbon footprint at each step of the value chain. We've also published in December child labor and human rights indices, um, which equally build on existing tools and framework like the ILO, UNICEF, etc., um, to showcase the pathways that companies need to take to really address the root causes of child labor um, and any potential human rights violations in their supply chains. Um, so transparency is key. But I would like to know, Matthias, maybe I'll direct this at you. Where do you see the key challenges with transparency? We've established a proof of concept now, reporting against these indices from cradle to gate, from mine to market was a core component of this. Umicore participated also in this piloting work, uh, exercise. So I'd be interested if you can share some experiences. Absolutely. I think you, and you mentioned already earlier, a key word in that, it's, it's trust. So if you want to be transparent, you have to be sure that what you give and, and you know, what you open up to the outside world is not used against you in a certain way. So I think that's the first uh, precondition that uh, we establish a system or any kind of supply chain that is looking to transparency in CO2 and others. Uh, we need to be sure that everybody who participates can have the trust that they own their data and that's not manipulated and it's not used in a different way than was agreed. And I think this has a lot to do with experience, but also with the system that is used uh, and the technical solutions that are put in place. So I think this would be the, you know, the, the, the base um, uh, of any kind of transparency. Now, on the other side, and I think there lies also a big challenge, if you want, going forward. The one thing is to put data in a system and trust that it's safe. The other question is, is the, is the data that you put in the right data? So how can the other side be sure that the, the, the data that is in the system that talks about um, a CO2 footprint of uh, one ton of nickel that has been harvested from a mine is calculated correctly? Or is, um, uh, you know, uh, there's no mistake inside or it has the right thing? So the whole uh, question of Auditing that process or having a, you know, also a third party assurance that the data is right in the most effective way so that both sides can basically trust the data. I think this is also the key. Uh, and and uh, alongside um, the forum, this is actually 
you know, the, the battery supply chain is a pioneer in addressing that. But I'm, I'm just coming from another uh, discussion about, in general, scope three um, decarbonization. That is a huge issue for all of the different supply chains. How to, write, you know, go back down to, to the farmer who is planting uh, 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 seeds and uh, the CO2 impact. I think what the GBA has put in place is really benchmark in that aspect, in all of the aspects where other value streams can really also still learn from. Thank you. Um, Benedict, this morning you sat in a press conference together with co-founding member BASF and Ellen MacArthur and proudly announced that we've issued the world's first battery passport this morning. Um, so we've heard this concept many times, but I'm wondering if it's worth explaining in a little bit more detail how it actually works um, and what some of the key first learnings were that we took away um, from this proof of concept. Yeah, thanks. Um, it's, it's incredibly exciting. Um, what I did this morning, I, I put up this little sticker here and I said, when you've looked carefully at some of the electric vehicles driving around in Davos, you're going to see a little sticker at the back of this. Right? And if you scan this code, a website opens up, which is a virtual twin of the battery that's in that car. So every single battery in a car in future, we believe is going to have a single identifiable number, which will allow it to trace back where the battery has been assembled, what are the technical specification of that battery, where the minerals that are in that battery have been refined, and where they have been produced and by whom. And that unique battery identifier number will allow you then to track that battery through the life cycle of this battery in the car. And um, when, you, when you go and scan this, and I recommend you, I think some of you, most of you actually have got one, some of your seat. It's, it's pretty exciting. You open it up and it shows you literally this cobalt unit came from this mine, right? And that's the producer. And by the way, here's the phone number if you want to call and see and check it out if it's true. Right? The same for, for, for lithium, you can do the same for nickel. So it's, um, it is a digital twin that will allow traceability for all of us, right? So it's not something that's hidden in an industry body that is trying to make something a secret. No, it is transparent, publicly available information, and that's very powerful. Um, somebody said, yesterday said, partnership is the new leadership. And the only reason why we could pull the battery passport together is because we had a collaborative engagement across the value chain. Now, usually, this panel here, we wouldn't actually speak to each other a lot. We'd have a mining industry, and you're going to have a battery-making industry, and so on. This is the power of the GBA. We actually go across industry, so along the entire supply chain, so everyone contributes data that is then made publicly available. You have civil society that helps us put together the rule books that are then mutually acceptable, and not industry standards, because industry standards are always a challenge. Right? This is a, a standard that is actually carried by a broad base of like-minded organizations, individuals, and, uh, and partners. So again, the power of, of the battery passport is first, it works, right? It's probably the first digital twin of a battery that has been put together by anyone. I mean, it's, it's really exciting. And I think this will be the blueprint for other industries. The electronics industry, I believe, is going to be the next. They can use the same technical solution that we're looking at for different, we're agnostic for which, which system to use. But to assemble this and make it publicly available, I think this is a real benchmark. And other industries are going to follow suit. So what we're now seeing here, uh, with the, the GBA having announced this as the first, is other organizations, other systems, other niches are galvanizing around the GBA uh, to see what they can learn from us. So I really encourage you to check this out. This is still just the pilots. So you can see three different pilots, two Audis, one Tesla, I think. Uh, one made in China, one made in Hungary, one made in Germany, if I recall it correctly. Uh, and then different mines, uh, South America, uh, Africa, and so on. So it's, it's tangible, it's real. And I think that's what we have to do. ESG is not about floating standards somewhere in the orbit. This is about impact on the ground, and this is what we're trying to do with the battery passport. Thanks, Benedict. And maybe for those of you who've already you know, looked into the data, um, just a couple of points building on this, because we've, we, we need to recognize that this proof of concept is really that. We're showing that the battery passport can work. It was originally conceptualized by the GBA in, in 2019, but it is an incredibly complex undertaking to actually um, make this a reality. And a lot of people in this room were involved uh, in making that happen. Um, so we've obviously faced uh, challenges. Uh, first of all, even composing these value chains from cradle to gate, um, getting our members to mobilize their partners. And we were able to do that in, the, in a trusted environment in the GBA. Um, 
one of the key um, elements that we have here is, is the global outlook, that we do not want to create a compliance instrument for a specific region, for a specific regulation, but really to say, how can we turn the vision of the GBA um, and transfer this into an indicator framework that operationalizes this vision? How do, how do we actually achieve it through the actions that we take? Um, so I'd, I'd like to bring you in again, Minister Fitzgibbon. You've heard about our greenhouse gas rule book. You heard about our child labor and human rights indices that, of course, you've also contributed to um, via your, your collaborators. How important is it to have globally harmonized standards in this industry? I think it's important, and uh, maybe it's uh, self-serving, because I feel we have uh, <coughs> a comparative advantage in North America in terms of uh, our minerals, our green electricity. But notwithstanding that, I think we're part of Scope 3. And we're the early part of the uh, EV uh, battery supply chain. I'd like to see Quebec as a leader in North America, as a provider of uh, battery materials, so henceforth to be participating in that passport, is our passport, to be legitimized in the industry. We've actually, uh, when, you, when you approached us, uh, we felt that it's pretty much a EU uh, endeavor right now, but clearly I think it'll become uh, worldwide, and we'd like to be leading that path forward for North American uh, different concerns, different uh, communities. We've also participated uh, with you on uh, graphite. We uh, use a, uh, a beta test using graphite throughout the process to make sure this traceability would provide us the, um, the legitimacy, I would say, in, uh, in the scope three. And I think we, we were favorably impressed. So we are supportive as a government. I think we need to be supporting this harmonization because at the end of the day, those who will be respectful of the rules uh, should benefit. I think we want to be part of that. And what do you think will be the key challenges in really facilitating broad uptake in North America? We have broad uptake or broad interest at least in, in Europe because the EU regulation is coming. Um, industry wants to be amongst the first adopters. They want to understand this framework. Um, so far, we have, of course, we have North American OEMs involved in this, but in order to help us socialize this and, and really facilitate broad uptake in North America, what do you think will be the key challenges and pathways? I think it's regulation. I think that uh, governments want, we need to regulate, we need to be um, respectful of the uh, ESG rules, but it's, that's not easy. I mean, going from, uh, to green energy, it's a nice, you wanna, wanna, we don't want a cliff, and we don't want to go to a point where, whoops, we need to be green, so therefore, Governments are reluctant to go too fast because then uh, on commitment because they may not be able to respect it. But I think the civil society is forcing us to make these uh, these changes. So I think regulation is the key. On the one hand, as I said earlier, we need to be conducive for concern to come and invest in our community. Uh, we don't want to go too fast because if we go too fast in uh, changing the regulation, too fast in bypassing some environmental rules, then civil society will not be uh, happy about it. And as a politician, we need to be sensitive to that. So I think regulation, by and large, is going to be the deterrent to that. But I think, at the same, at the same extent, civil society will force it. Because at the end of the day, they will want to see the, the battery uh, traceability. They will want to see what, what, kind, what kind of car. It's nice to buy a EDV car, where it comes from. So I think, no, the, the, the pressure from civil society will force an acceleration, but at the same time, civil society will not permit us to be bypassing the rules. So it will be kind of a, a paradox there for a while, but I think uh, we'll, we'll get to the right place. Thank you. Um, the GBA and the members have committed to 10 guiding principles, um, and we want to scale sustainable, circular, and responsible value chains. For now, through the battery passport, we're addressing only <laughs> the battery carbon footprint and child labor and human rights as really the, the key priority issues that were identified. However, sustainable, circular, and responsible contains many more elements. I'd maybe like to turn either to Benedict or to Matthias or to both of you. What do you think will be the next priorities? What are the missing rule books, the missing standards that are essential to really realizing this vision of sustainable, circular, and responsible battery value chains? Maybe uh, both we can contribute because a little bit of different angles. So from my point of view, there are two. I mean, the good thing is, first, once you have the structure set up, you can do anything. It's just a matter of uh, how to get the data into the system. Now, for me, there are two things that could be next. We talked about the scaling up of this uh, industry. It's scaling up extremely fast. And if you scale up something very fast, it can be also dangerous in terms of execution. So. One other thing that could be measured uh, in the global battery passport is safety. 
safety for the people involved in the value chain and uh, Ultimately, it needs to be a zero accident result. We know that it's not always possible, but it should be a striving to get as close to zero as possible. And if we can show that, that's an, a very important factor. And then the other one that would be more into the mining side, because today uh, we see a lot of um, negative voices against mining, for example, mining in Europe, why we need that, etc. I personally think we really need it. Because it's for, of course, there is a negative impact, but the uh, sum of the parts is a positive if you count uh, the close proximity value chain. So, what could be included as well is other kinds of pollution. We don't talk about CO2, but uh, any other type of pollution that is produced along the value chain. And if we can show that it's actually going also uh, decreasing year over year, that might also lead to better acceptance and, and transparency. Yeah, Matthias, I'd, I'd probably just add to that is uh, everything around uh, labor standards, occupational health, occupational safety, uh, biodiversity, and water. Those for me would be the next three things I would like to do. Uh, water is a huge problem in, in mining because, well, just the physics of it, right? You make a hole and then the hole fills with water and you have to pump out the water to keep mining. Very simplicity speaking. So, so water usage uh, is, a, is a challenge in many regions in lithium production and nickel production and as well. Um, so those were the three areas to look at, but I think, I'm sure Inga has got plenty of other ideas what could be put in there. The beauty is, is we have a system in place, right, and we can now slot in all the different drawers as the GBA and its members seem fit for purpose. So that's an, that's an opportunity we, we now have. Uh, we just need to decide which ones, which drawer we want to put in next. I'm, uh, thank you so much for that. I'm, I'm going to take advantage of the fact that we have another member of the GBA Supervisory Council in the room. Um, the GBA is not an industry association. We are truly committed to multi-stakeholder and to listening to all the voices um, in this ecosystem of batteries. So Atle Hoye is the Secretary General of Industrial Global Union. And um, I'd be keen listening. Uh, you've now had a time to absorb all of this. I'm ambushing you a little bit, but I would like to, to invite you to react and add your perspectives um, on what you've heard in the session so far. Thank you, Inga. Uh, can you hear me? Yes? Good. Uh, let, let me start by saying that together with Benedict and probably a couple of others here in the room, we were at, attending a session yesterday where the president of the Democratic Republic of Congo said that today's business model made it impossible to not have child labor. I mean, that, that's, that's the baseline we're in today. Now, we have to get away from that. We have to get away from child labor, that's obvious, but we have to include other human rights into a system. And that's why, as Benedict and others have said, the transparency of this system that we have created is extremely important. It's important for the general public to be able to follow and see what it is. It's important for us as trade unions uh, to be able to hold companies accountable. And that's why it's extremely important for us that you have chosen to include trade unions directly from the beginning of this process. Because what we very often see is that initiatives, governments, businesses would want to hold, keep trade unions away until they can't do it anymore. And then you've lost a couple of years on the way to creating a system that actually works. Because as I've said a couple of times during this, uh, this week, you can have a solution that is technically, technologically beautiful. It's politically viable, you think, but if those are gonna do the work, enforce or implement the solutions, don't understand them, don't agree, or just don't want to do it, then you don't get a fully-fledged solution. So having including, included trade unions in this process, having an open dialogue with us, creating the transparency of the system that the Global Battery Alliance has done, I think are the keys to success, and that's why we really have faith in this, uh, in this process. Thank you so much. I, um, <clears throat> I'd now like to open up the floor, actually, for questions. I see there's already some coming. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, um, please. Uh, thank you. My name is Philippe Monnier. I represent different organizations from Switzerland. I have a question regarding whether you are working with the United Nations. I understand that you are based in Geneva, and in Geneva there is UNIC, and they have a working party called Working Party 20, 29, where they define the regulation for the automotive industry, even though it is called UNIC, United Economic Commission for Europe, the members are worldwide, uh, Japan, uh, China, 
and I understand they have enormous influence on, on the rules of the of regulation of the automotive industry because all their members have to apply what they decide. Yes, thank you for that question. We are indeed working with a number of UN organizations. UNICEF, UN Environment Programme are all members of the Alliance, um, and so are UNEC. They've been involved in this first version of our Greenhouse Gas Rulebook, for example. So one thing to note on these indices um, is that we've published a first iteration. The next step is going to be broad-based multi-stakeholder consultation on this, uh, including alignment with other frameworks that are being put forward. Um, we do believe that we've put forward very strong proposals that are not the result of industry um, consultation only, but really uh, include this multiplicity of voices. So we are going into that next phase. We'll be strategically um, consulting with um, other standard setters uh, in the sector um, to really try and harmonize um, the indices being put forward and the standards. One, one aspect, if I may add, uh, that I find very important um, the GBA has to have a certain representativity of its industry and of the landscape. I mean, this is not a European organization trying to lecture other countries how to work, um, and it's not a US organization. This is really trying to represent the world in the energy storage space. And we have to be cognizant that the majority of the batteries today are made in Asia. Um, the main commodities today, lithium, essentially 80% comes from two countries. Uh, cobalt essentially comes from one country. Um, and you can do that for, for other products, and nickel, for example, three countries, probably 70% of world production. So uh, you have to have certain representativity, um, and that includes particularly some of our Asian members. Uh, we cannot, um, we have an obligation to talk with the battery industry and not about the battery industry. And I think we've, we've been reasonably successful. Um, CATL has just joined us as, uh, as, a, as my, my co-chair. Um, they are the world's largest battery maker. Um, so we have to be inclusive, uh, then we can be effective. Yes, <laughs> I see the right hand going up, I think, on that mention. Hi, my name is... Oh, yeah, my name is Forrest. I'm from CATL. Yeah, I'm, yeah I'm, I'm very glad to join this session. My question is how you get data, how you collect data from the supply chain. Actually, it's a very uh, hot topic in our company. We're trying to do this by ourselves, but it's hard to get the right data in the right time. So that's my question. Would one of you like to take this? Should I venture a response? <laughs> well, I can only talk to the upstreamers, and the upstream is surprisingly simple um, because there are actually not so many producers and producing countries of these minerals. Um, of course, you have to make sure you, you, you cannot cover the whole industry immediately. Um, and that's why we've, in these pilots, focused on certain supply chains where you can actually delineate what's in and what's out. I think the bigger challenge is in the, what, I, what we call the midstream, which are the cool guys, right? not, not us, is, is what happens in the midstream as these sources of supply from different countries, different operators, get blended into one midstream refinery. That's where the challenge, from my opinion, is. The upstream is, is relatively easy, it's transparent, you can look on Google, Google Earth, where the mines are, you can, you can go and visit them. It's actually pretty simple. So the question is more to you in the midst. Yeah, and for us, uh, the actual, we are not adding to the equation, uh, as you could think, because midstream, what is means making uh, cathode materials, uh, mostly, um, is already today uh, a net zero operation, because it's mainly driven by uh, electric energy. And, uh, you know, we and all of our, most of our competitors are going in the direction of having that uh, you know, covered with renewable energies. However, the big issue is exactly as you said, how to blend the data together because you have different sources that have uh, different footprints and then you can more and more have recycling streams also coming in that have to be treated differently from uh, a CO2 load point of view. There are rules already defined how that works and what should be accounted when, um, uh, but I think as for all of those data management systems, uh, garbage in is garbage out, so that means to start at the beginning, really to, and, and I agree with you that it's, you can go, go, go on Google Maps, but still I think diligent work on each of the mines to see, you know, also update all those figures, I think this, this is the, you know, the starting point of everything. Yeah, and perhaps from re the regulate, regulatory perspective, in Quebec we have a lot of mining and some of the critical elements. I think part of the permitting 
there's issue about data as well because all the mines in Quebec are not homogeneous in terms of uh, their CO2 footprint. So we're beginning now, of course, to try to collect that data from a, from a permitting perspective, which we'll put in the value chain of the passport eventually. Yeah, and maybe just from our perspective. So for the GBA, we do not necessarily want to dictate the parameters of the data collection instrument, the IT solutions, the infrastructure that is going to host the battery passport um, in the ecosystem later on. For us, what's important is that everybody reports to the same rules, that these results can be comparable, that we apply the same standards when it comes to disclosure, when it comes to verification, third party audits. So we've really focused our efforts on creating this harmonized set of rules that we do not end up, uh, and for example, if you look at the greenhouse gas rule book, it's building on existing standards, but what it does is eliminate ambiguities um, so that we can really have a comparable result at the end um, and hopefully inform consumer decisions based on that um, and drive demand for lower carbon um, products in, in the battery value chain. There's another hand going up there. Thanks very much. Uh, <clears throat> my name is Mike Posner. I'm at uh, NYU Stern School of Business, Center for Business and Human Rights. I want to ask especially about cobalt and the artisanal, the informal mining sector where there are hundreds of thousands of workers. It's where child labor is the greatest risk and also mine safety. How are you, gonna, how are you thinking about monitoring, gathering data about mine safety, the tunnels, child labor in the artisanal sector of the cobalt mines in the DRC? Maybe a quick comment before I hand over to Benedict. So one thing worth noting on the current child labor index that we've published and that we've uh, pilot tested is that it's not tailored for the artisanal sector at this point. So this first proof of concept for the battery passport is really focused on uh, industrial mines um, in terms of the upstream. And um, in the process of developing these indices, it became clear very quickly that the artisanal mining sector will require probably a dedicated index in itself because we cannot uh, roll out a tool, a reporting template, a framework that is tailored for the industry to the artisanal sector. It needs uh, a special uh, approach that we need to incorporate in the future. So I'll just add that from the process perspective and maybe hand over to Benedict, who's got the on the ground insights. Yeah, I mean, originally one of the main themes of the, the GBA was actually to try and eradicate uh, child labor from the supply chain. It's, a, it's an ingrained problem, it's a huge problem, and it's a problem that doesn't go away. In all these years, 10 years, we're now operating there, it doesn't go away. You have in the DRC, which is, well, most people don't know this, but if you put a, you drop a pen on the city of Kolwezi, which is in the south of the Congo, and you draw a circle of about 100 kilometers, you have 80% of the world's cobalt supply. It's what we call in the mining industry a freak of nature, right? Similar only rare earths in China, the Baotou mine, which produces the majority of the world's rare earths uh, for, for all of us. Um, and you have a handful of industrial operators, maybe a hand and a half, um, of which actually most of them are members of the GBA. And then you have a sector which is probably about 30% of the, the production, which is not an industrial operation and which relies on supply coming from informal, in some cases, illegal operations. Um, so what I think that the, the passport today cannot do, it cannot say um, whether an operation has child labor in its product, but it can say which operation doesn't by actually excluding those ones that, that we know are certified by standards that are assurance processes. In the case of some of our operations, we have cameras everywhere, so if somebody would like to see our operations, they can go log in and they can see actually what, what's happening there. We're 100% transparent and I always invite people to come and visit some of our plants, it's not a secret. But it really is that, that, that 30, 35,000 ton of material that's produced with unknown origins which you will see in the battery passport, you will see the supply should say large scale mining, large scale mining, large scale mining. And then for some of the automotive companies, there might be an uncomfortable conversation if there's a 30% a component in their cobalt supply where they cannot explain where it comes from. But I think that will drive the right discussions. Follow up question over there. I don't... Thank you very much. My name is Lydia Neubel. Managing Director from Deloitte Sustainability and Climate in Germany. And my question would be, we're talking a lot about transparency. We all know that transparency normally costs a lot of money because um, you need to get the data, you need to get everything included. So 
I would be interested in your perspective on the chances and how do you see it for your companies making sure that having a good performance actually gives you probably a competitive advantage today and how do you see it when we look into the future? Maybe I can take this one because I, I, I think we talked about what are the components that we're measuring. One of the big ones we start with is uh, carbon footprint, the scope three of an electric vehicle, right? And uh, today an electric vehicle is much worse for the environment to be produced than a combustion engine car. So it is certain that there will be an incentive in the future to reduce the carbon emissions for the car manufacturers. Right? Everybody wants to have, in ideal case, zero CO2 footprint uh, electric vehicles. Also the end customers are asking for that already today. So then there comes the legislative that says um, uh, the scope three, today scope one and scope two, is if you want punished uh, by penalties, scope three will be part of that. I am 100% sure about this. And when you then have the choice to pay more for uh, a material, uh, raw material or processed material that is much lower in CO2 footprint, and with that you can save a lot of penalties, you will be able to pay more, which is a good business case for the companies in the supply chain. And, and that's more and more coming true. But I think it's going more from a stick to a carrot because ultimately the end consumer will not accept to buy cars that destroy the environment by producing them and they have to drive them 100,000 kilometers. It's not Audi, 100,000 kilometers before they are better than a diesel engine. And I think this will drive the market, will drive that supply chain in a way that it is a profitable business to be CO2 low and that will be also the case for the other parameters that we are measuring. I think we might have time for one final question before we briefly give an opportunity for any closing remarks, including also from Audi in case you feel the need. <laughs> Everything's been said. Um, is there, are there any more questions? Any questions to each other? Any final thoughts? We've resolved everything. Um, fantastic. I really, um, really appreciate uh, the interest that you show in this topic. I think it's, it's become clear that this represents a major milestone of what we've achieved. Uh, it's also worth pointing out, I think when you're looking at the data, you, you might have a couple of questions. What does safeguarded mean? Um, what does you know, review and process mean? So essentially, what we've established um, is a comparable indicator already but it's based on partial reporting, and we did not want to encourage any premature comparisons of products that should not be compared at this stage to really not disincentivize um, our pioneers you know, from the next round of pilots as, we're, as they're testing the waters of this concept. Um, what's also really worth uh, highlighting is that, and Josef can, uh, can attest it maybe from Audi's perspective, that the, even though we're at the proof of concept stage, we're already having an impact because participating OEMs learned for the first time the exact mine sites that they're sourcing their cobalt from. So this immediately triggered due diligence processes um, that are already um, establishing has this material been responsibly sourced, et cetera. Um, we also, these proof of concept pilots, we've worked with uh, three battery cell producers. CATL is in the room. We've also worked with Samsung and LG Energy Solution. That represents over 50% of the global battery market. So. For us, this is a really strong signal and gives us a lot of confidence that we can make this the norm, um, that we're getting the buy-in and this is not going to be a nice to have, but really a must have uh, to differentiate on, on sustainability performance. Um, so with that, I'd sincerely like to um, thank our speakers, our hosts, our impromptu speakers <laughs> that joined us for the session. And, um, and I'll close with the plea to join us on this journey. Benedict highlighted um, that this could be applicable to the electronics, um, but of course, equally applicable to energy storage solutions if we're looking in the other direction. So uh, we are extremely proud of what has been achieved by the members of the GBA, and we're hoping that we can now accelerate this journey and, and get everybody on board. Thank you so much. Bye.